Hello and welcome back everyone to another week. This week I am I was just telling my guest that my face is physically splitting with a smile right now. I'm so overjoyed to have this next guest with us today. Dr. Errol L. Pierre is a business executive, healthcare strategist, public speaker, professor, and author. He currently serves as the senior vice president of state programs at Health First, the largest nonprofit health plan in New York. He also is the former chief operating officer of Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield, the largest for health, excuse me, for profit health plan in New York. Errol graduated from Fordham University, let's go Rams, with a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in finance. He later obtained a master's degree in health policy and financial management from New York University and recently completed his doctorate in business administration from the Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College, focusing on health economics. He is an adjunct professor at NYU, Columbia, Baruch, teaching health economics and health transformation. Errol is an avid art collector and spends his time buying and promoting art from the Haitian and African diaspora. In 2017, he was the executive producer of a documentary film entitled 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti, directed by Tariq Nasheed. He also volunteers for various nonprofit organizations, serving as the board member of the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health, Medinova, New York, and the 100 Black Men of Long Island. As a Fordham University alum, he serves as a member of the President's Council and the Athletic Advisory Committee. And I, it is just my true joy to introduce you all to Dr. Pierre. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great to see you. It is so great to see you. So I always like to start out my episodes with, Errol, how do we know each other? You know what? Crazy story, because we had <laughs> uh, mutual friends. So mm -hmm. I was working with someone at a health insurance company I'm, now I'm dating myself. <laughs> yes. Uh, more than 15 years ago. Crazy. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they were very close friends with you. Mm -hmm. And once they moved to New York, the rest is history. We were That's it? getting pizza at 2 a.m. on the streets <laughs> of New York City. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was awesome to, uh, and I actually then visited uh, Indianapolis as well. So it's just been Awesome. That and that was yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking back to dancing on rooftops in Brooklyn. And <laughs> when you came to New York or to Indianapolis after I had left New York, was that I was like, you're coming to Indianapolis? Amazing. So we've exactly. we've six, hung out in six many in the country. Yes, 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 yes. Well, it is my true joy to have you on today. Um, I'm so excited, and I just I. It's so great to see all of the things you're doing. I love all of the speaking engagements that you've had and the passion that you have for the things that you do. Um, and, and so I, I guess I kind of wanted to start out with understanding like, why healthcare? How did you get, how did you get into that? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, totally accidental. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, I bumped into healthcare not even realizing I was gonna be good at it, not realizing how big it was, mm -hmm. uh, not realizing how pervasive it is in our economy. It's everywhere you look. It is everywhere mm -hmm. you look. I don't think people realize, like uh, employers, after rent and their lease, the number one cost for a company is their benefits that they provide their employees. Sure. Uh, so, so, you know, it's everywhere. It's everywhere you go. But I, I actually stumbled upon it through an internship and found out that I somewhat was good at it. But I, I had no idea. Um, the internship turned into a full-time gig after college, and the rest is history. And I've been on the sort of the insurance side, so they call it the payer side of um, healthcare. So this is like how to make it affordable for people, mm -hmm. how to make sure they get coverage, and then understanding all the nuances of why people have it and don't have it. Mm -hmm. um, that's really how I got involved. And you know, I I didn't know what health insurance was until I was an adult, but I knew what it was like not to have full insurance. So like mm -hmm. my parents, um, they had union benefits, but for example, like our dental coverage wasn't that great. So yeah. I knew what it felt like when they said, oh, Errol, we can't do this service until next year because you hit your maximum. So right. if you want your, your this, this dental visit, you have to wait till January 1st. So as a kid, I kind of knew that there was some like issues around it, but then obviously as an adult that I like jumped in mm -hmm. uh, with both feet, tried to, tried to solve the, you know, save the world. 
Say the, I love it. And solving the world's problem, figuring out where the world, the, the stem of the problem and how then we can you know, retro engineer something to make it make sense and make it actually serve the people that need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. And now, and also obviously near and dear to my heart, how did you get into teaching? I'm so excited. Uh, I would love to be in one of your classes. Maybe we'll have to figure out if you ever do an online one. Maybe I can uh, audit it sometime. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, now it's Zoom. You can like sneak in and just keep your box, you know, right? keep your camera off in the yeah. corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Teaching, you know, it's funny. Um, I went back to grad school and my professor, uh, I'll never forget her, uh, Professor McPhail, uh, mm -hmm. who was my intro to public um, health class. She was looking for um, teacher's assistants. And she's like, Errol, is this something you'd want to do? And, you know, I was like, oh, I guess so. She could tell, like, in class, I would raise my hand. I was kind of a nerd, you know, I sat in front. <laughs> I always was particip participatory. Like, I was the kid that, like, you know, she, I would raise my hand and she'd say, anyone else? <laughs> so, I heard from you, sir. Anybody yeah. else? Participate? Give him those participation points that he's taken? No? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, she's like, you know, I'm, I need a TA. Um, what do you think? And so I, I was like, yeah, sure. So mm -hmm. uh, I did it for the experience, not for the money, because they don't pay TAs anything. Sure. Um, and I ended up, ended up grading papers. And then she would like allow me to actually speak in, at uh -huh. some of the classes. And so that morphed from like just grading papers to then speaking. And then when I, at that time, I was like, I can do a whole course. Like mm -hmm. at first I was nervous. And I was sure. like, oh, you know, I can do this. I can do this. This is New York City, so I apologize for the noise. I, don't know if you I was going to say, it's so funny. I was like, man, I feel like I'm right back there. <laughs> New York City does not care your recording. They just they do not. You know, you know it's interesting. When I when I first left New York, after having lived there for you know two years, I actually would turn on like a snore machine app that had, they called it City Noise, because it was so quiet in Indianapolis. <laughs> yes. I have since, obviously, it's been a decade since I've lived there, which is sad to admit, but uh since do not need the street noise, but yeah, it's, it's uh, something that you just kind of grow accustomed to. I get it. I mean, I get it. When it's too quiet, I can't sleep. I'm like, something's wrong. What's going on? Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, so I was a TA and, uh, you know, it's interesting. Everything happened through relationships. So I did a um, public speaking engagement at a hospital um, in Nassau County. This is Long Island, right outside the city. And the president of that hospital heard me speak. And he's like, look, I teach at three schools. Uh, I'm actually moving to a new job in New York. You can absolutely teach one of these classes. You're awesome. And this was around the Affordable Care Act when uh, President Obama was president, like 2009, sure. around 2009, 2008. And uh, I was like, sure. You know, didn't have no clue what to do. Like yeah. never taught, never created a syllabus. Mm -hmm. um, said yeah sure okay and then just started googling yeah and uh, that's how it happened so I took over his health economics class at Molloy College mm -hmm. and that was my first full-time gig and that's mm -hmm. how I started teaching yeah. and um the rest is history yeah oh I love that that's so great it is that moment of like oh I'd really love to teach and then it's like oh you have a class what am I going to teach I know I know what I'm talking about, but like, how do you structure across 12, 16, eight, depending on how long the semester is weeks of like, you need to read this chapter. And then I'm going to talk about this. And it's important that it goes with that chapter. And yeah, it's, absolutely. it is, it is a lot to contemplate. Yes. But they're like, no, I, but I know what I'm talking about. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, I think I knew like, the exact lesson I wanted to teach because when I did my interview, I had to do like a, a teaching simulation. So they wanted to see how I taught. So okay. that lesson I chose for my simulation, I knew like the back of my hand. Like, I'm like, oh, I know this. I know this. And then it's like, you have to do that 12 times. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, then, yeah. yeah. So I remember they said, you got the job. Then it's like, send me your syllabus next week. I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah. Oh it, my is, God. it is. Once you do it the first semester uh -huh. for a lesson, it gets easier. But the yes. first semester is definitely hard to build the yes. curriculum. Absolutely. Yeah. And I remember the woman, our academic program 
um, advisor, she was like, don't worry, it takes like three semesters to get good. Don't worry about it. Just, it's fine. Just, you know, get through it. It's going to be great. You're going to get there. I was like, well, that's really, that made me feel good of like, not that the bar is low, but just like, don't, don't stress about it too much. Show your passion for the, for the subject matter. If, if your syllabus is not perfectly lined up, the information is still going to get taught. And yeah, again, yeah. the passion that you have for sharing the information really is the most important piece. Yeah, yeah I'll tell you, the best book ever put in my palm, one of the best books was um, a book called Being Bad First. I don't remember the author, but great book. But the lesson of it was um, you, you will be bad at something new. Yes. So what always happens to people is once they get some sort of uh, expertise in something, uh -huh. it's very hard for them to leave it and try something new mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they are so used to how it feels to be an expert in that craft. And so like Absolutely. for teaching, for example, it was like, you're going to be bad first. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's okay. You're going to mm -hmm. learn. So I, I absolutely, like by the third, fourth semester, you have your sea legs. You're more right. comfortable. Right. But if you never take a chance to be bad at something, like you never grow. So that, that book definitely like things are like it's like you can be a really smart person and be bad at something if uh -huh. that can happen absolutely so. I you know I think it's tough because we I think we've gotten to this culture a lot where we feel like we do have to be the expert at things and where we struggle to say that we don't know or the answer is no or and and that's I mean that's true both professionally and then personally too one of the examples I like to use is that I used to play the piano pretty well but I haven't played for a while. And so I really want to get back into it, but I know I'm going to be bad. So I don't want to do it because I'm not going to be as good as I used to be, but I can't get as good as I used to be if I don't play it. So, yes. Right. And so absolutely. And I, I so I'm being bad first. I've written that down. I'm going to Google that afterwards. I'll put it in the show notes because I want to read that book, especially if you liked it, but just being bad first, I think is such an important thing for us. That's how we learn is through failure or through, okay. you know, figuring it out <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like we have amnesia like whatever we did first we were bad at but now we're experts so we're like i can't leave i'm so good at this so i can't try something new it's like yes. we forget that we were bad at that first thing first so absolutely oh my gosh absolutely we yeah, have what a great perspective i will i will for sure find out whoever wrote being bad first and we'll put that in the notes for sure um so tell me so you, um i am i have phd envy one day i'm gonna get one I would love to do research, but uh, that's not my path right now. Tell me about how you decided that that's what your next step was, getting yeah. into the doctorate program, how you chose a dissertation topic. What did that all look like for you? How did that come to be? Yeah. So, you know, um, I don't know if I was told this or I came across it. I, I should probably be giving someone who's really smart credit for this, <laughs> but uh, I just don't remember. But I, I, for some strange reason, I landed on, and maybe someone did say it, I just don't remember who. Uh, when you do your bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. it teaches you how to think. So all okay. you're learning is just how to process information, okay. synthesize data, put together disparate you know, information and try to tell a story. Mm -hmm. All it is is like how to process information as an adult. That's what a bachelor's degree is for. It's like when people you know, um, apply for jobs, people are like, well, I'm smarter. And just because I don't have a bachelor's degree doesn't mean I'm not qualified. And I'm always like, that's true. Mm -hmm. The only thing like a bachelor's degree proves is that you've gone through a systematic process for four mm -hmm. years of mm -hmm. learning how to think. Mm -hmm. That's it. Learning how to do papers, learning how to work with people, learning how to process information. That's all it is. And, and actually like showing up on time for classes. Like you have <laughs> <Well>. some... <laughs> There's some money, it's, it just proves like you're an adult, like you can actually like do something. Sure. So then you're like, okay, well then why does someone go for the master's? And when I went to my, for my master's program, it was because I was like, I know the field that I want to focus in. And right. I understand now where I want to specialize. It was health policy, financial management. It's like, I'm going to double click, you know, I'm on a mouse, I'm going to double click on these topics. I want to learn more. Yeah. So master's degree is like learn from the experts in that craft. So you do your master's degree, you're reading from the PhDs of that practice that you're learning about or whatever the topic is, right? Sure. And so I did that. Then I'm in healthcare. So I graduated, I have my master's degree, it's 2013. And now I'm reading all of these research papers from all of these really smart people about health issues. And they're talking about me. They're like, African-American disparities are of the worst. You know, African-American life expectancy is going to be 65. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. versus uh, the average for America is 72 or 73. Mm -hmm. uh, African-Americans are more prone to diabetes, hypertension, obesity. African-Americans die from COVID more than anyone else. So I'm reading all these papers about me. And then when I look at the authors, they're not, they don't look like me, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And so it didn't mean that that was bad. I, right. I just felt like there needs to be more people from that, that culture, from the ethnicity that are doing research about their own people, because yeah. there's going to be less mm -hmm. bias. There's going to be more information. They're more tuned to the population. They're in the weeds because it's, it's them. And right. there's probably nuances and subtleties that they will be able to um, uh, um, think through that potentially someone who's not part of that culture wouldn't be able to. Not to no fault of their own. It's just different when you're in it, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, like when you're in healthcare and they keep telling you, you know, all of these disparities and they're disproportionately on certain demographics and you're part of that demographic, it just compelled me to mm. say, I, I want to be able to be part of the experts that I was reading when I was doing my master's. Right. So that's really what drove me to do my doctorate program. Um, I'm, I work full time. So right. PhD can be like five, seven years. So I found a program at CUNY. It was the first year of the program. So I was on the original cohort. Where wow. It was, yeah, it's awesome. Where it's an executive doctorate of business administration. And it's made for people who will work full time. Wow. So rather than seven years, I did it um, from 2018 to 2022. So it's four uh -huh. years. And you go in with your dissertation topic. So like when you apply, you basically yeah. say, this is the dissertation I want to do. Mm -hmm. And so kind of, you know, it's more expedient because rather than like for the first two to three years, you're just kind of learning. You right. go in starting the program, knowing your topic that you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a part-time program. It was an executive program. So like my, my cohort, I have this gentleman, um, uh, Jimmy, who's like, he, he built and ran a multi-billion dollar startup in South Korea. And he was in my cohort. Wow. Like, amazing. Wow. Yeah. So like you get to class, I'm like, I'm the dumbest person here. Ah! <laughs> you know? um, and there was another gentleman uh, who worked at, at um, one of the big four consulting companies doing accounting. And, you know, it was on multi-billion dollar projects for like Fortune 500 companies. Mm. Um, there was a gentleman who, did, who was a trader, just uh, traded stocks, um, brilliant man. And he was like explaining, you know, how to beat the, the index average. It's like really, really wow. smart folks. And I was like, the, I know, the, I was like, I'm, I'm in healthcare. Like, <laughs> I felt like all the their topics were much cooler, but um, it was a great program. It was a great program. And, oh, yeah. and so, you know, it, it teaches you research, theory, validity, um, algorithms. We took a class on um, econometrics, ugh, like how to run data and re regressions. So it was yeah. awesome. It was, it was like, um, uh, uh, it was basically the program was how to do research and how to publish um, Valid, you know, valid papers that mm -hmm. can stand the test of peer review, and you know, right. uh, you know. So, it, and it's what it's the basis of everything we do. Like research, essentially creates policy. So, I definitely wanted to be in a perspective where I can have a title and the learning and the gravitas to step into the healthcare arena and actually weigh in on some of these policies that's happening in America. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I love that. And wow. I, you know, I had obviously had been following along in your story and that's so great to get to hear kind of who you were rubbing shoulders with and learning from, and they had the opportunity to learn from you. Cause I think sometimes too, when we're in these, I don't want to say silos, but kind of we're in our chosen fields and we don't necessarily kind of contemplate the things that are, are around us and healthcare, of course, being one of them. So I'm sure they were probably, they're probably on a podcast somewhere talking about, oh, this guy, Errol, I mean, he knows everything there is about health and I didn't know. And now I know all these things. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. So, uh, so what was your dissertation topic? Yeah. So it's an interesting story. The, the, my dissertation was actually on how immigration impacts healthcare usage and how many, how much people sign up for healthcare. So okay. enrollment, enrollment of healthcare and usage of healthcare. And the topic really came from um, this rule 
that came about during the Trump administration called public charge. So okay. like back in the uh, 1800s, there was this concept that it was a law of the land in America called public charge. And okay. what it did was say, when someone comes to America, we are gonna assess whether they're going to be a public charge to the country. Okay. Public charge means, will they be a burden to the system? So mm -hmm. when they come here, are they gonna be on food stamps, you know, rent control? Uh, are they gonna use more services than they're actually gonna give? That, right. that type of thing. So mm -hmm. they, they, when they opened up the, the you know, the, the borders and they wanted immigrants to come, they were like, we want immigrants that are gonna add value to America. So when they come here, they're going to get a job. They're actually, they're, they're tax paying money. They're, they're, they're not going to use public benefit. They're actually going to be a net positive to the country. So there was this equation that would determine if someone was going to be a charge to the country or benefit. So that was like old, old, old law that people really weren't using. No one knew about it. It was right. obscure. And because of how heated the debate was, around immigration, they resurrected that rule. And it was the first time in the country's history they said, if you are gonna use Medicaid, which is a government program right. for healthcare, that's gonna to count towards being a public charge. Mm. First time we ever in the country's history said that getting healthcare is a burden because you know now I'm putting my health economics hat on and this is right. gonna get nerdy for two seconds. Please, please answer the <laughs> children. Let it go. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, always the theory about healthcare was we don't give health care to other people because we're like altruistic and nice and like we're do-gooders. We give health care to other people so that they don't get us sick. So the whole reason why like the COVID vaccination was free, like we're not giving it for free because we're nice people. We're giving it for free so that you don't get me sick. Right. Yeah. So it was it, it, healthcare was really this externality debate of like, um, if they don't have coverage, they're not going to go to the doctor. That means they're going to be walking around with the flu. Mm -hmm. They're going to be walking around with, you know, COVID. They're going to be sick. They're also going to be at home and not at work, which means they're not going to be paying taxes. So like giving people healthcare was actually like perceived as an economic benefit so mm -hmm. that people have less sick days and they're more productive in society. So to say, oh, healthcare is a burden, which was a different interpretation during the administration, was just like people were just like, what? So like as an economist, yeah. I was like, hmm, like I want people to get healthcare because I'm on the subway and they're like well, uh, one yes. foot away from me. <laughs> you yes. know, they're, they're yes. one foot away from me, standing next to me, eating a mask, and I hope that they're not positive. Right. So I don't want any barrier for them to stay protected. Yeah. Uh, so it was a big change. But because of that law, through my dissertation, I was able to say, okay, let's see, how will the law impact immigrants? Will immigrants use healthcare differently than citizens? Mm -hmm. That was really the dissertation. It was a natural experiment to say, once the law went into effect, because it did go into effect, mm -hmm. what did immigrants do because of this law, knowing that using Medicaid would be a public charge versus US citizens that weren't impacted? So right. we could actually have a control group to see how it how it changed and and the results were um, immigrants when the law was passed used healthcare eight percent less than U.S. citizens and they disenrolled from Medicaid at uh, three percent uh, times higher than U.S. citizens. So wow. and this happened right before the pandemic. So you, you they made this policy change and you had immigrants not going to the doctor eight percent less than U.S. citizens. And then you had immigrants disenrolling from coverage they're eligible for. Mm -hmm. And this happened right before the pandemic. So we basically had a higher uninsured rate and less yeah. people going to the doctor going into a pandemic. So that, that was really the dissertation. And uh, the, the intent of it was to say, we need to think about healthcare when we think about immigration reform. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just think about immigration in a vacuum. You have to think about immigration and all the downstream impacts, one of the impacts is, is definitely healthcare. Absolutely. I'm so excited to hear that you have that because th that you're putting in the legwork on that because that is something, nothing ever really happens in a vacuum. And I think sometimes we think very singularly about certain topics of 
yes or no, this or that. And, and there are so many mitigating factors that kind of seem to be overlooked or potentially uh, ignored on purpose. I don't know, but, um, but yeah, so I'm really excited to hear that. I was curious, you mentioned the subway. How, what was it like going through COVID in New York City? What was that like for you? Man. I, I genuinely, I can't. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, I, you ever watch I Am Legend? Yes. Movie? Yes. There was like, no one's outside. Uh -huh. like, I know the last time you were in New York City, it, the streets were packed. March of this year was the last oh, time okay. in New York City, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, so, so um, you know, pre-COVID, New York City, the streets were packed. Yes. Yes. I yes. was able in the in the middle of COVID to drive down to Times Square from the Bronx. I lived in the Bronx um, in like twenty five minutes. No traffic, no cars. Yeah, Times Square. Chills. Times Square, empty. No Elmo. No naked cowboy playing the guitar. No panhandlers. No like empty. You know the steps where everyone uh -huh. takes picture. Uh huh. Empty. Like Times Square was empty, Rockefeller Center, empty, Harold Square, empty, where the Macy's Parade ends. Uh -huh. it, 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 it's, I don't even know how to describe New York City. People stayed indoors for the most part. And, you know, we were, we were the epicenter of it. Uh -huh. um, I remember they were building 10 hospitals in Central Park because Mount Sinai was overrun uh -huh. with dead bodies. I mean, it's very morbid. Mm -hmm. There were tractor trailers on the outside of hospitals like Elmer's Hospital because they were like, we ran out of space. There's not this enough bodies. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was crazy. It was, it was, it's insane. I think everyone has trauma. They just haven't like, I don't know if they've like reconciled with it, but it yeah. was, I can't imagine 8 million people in New York City and you walk outside and not a soul was outside. It was just, wow. I don't even know how to describe it. It was, it was I, we saw a video and so I mean, I'm out here in Kansas and I was lucky to be in a single family dwelling and feel very locked down. And I remember all of my friends in New York who live in certain you know, situations and seeing the video that I think I was, I am legend the first, one of the only times that they ever actually shut down Times Square for filming. I remember that was like a big deal. And then to hear you say that you made it from the, I've been to your house in the Bronx down to Times Square in 25 minutes blows my mind. Truly, truly. I mean, yeah. anybody who's not been to New York can just imagine New York traffic. Yeah. And you're right though about the trauma of all of that and seeing all those things and hearing all those things and um, being witness to all of that. And we're all just kind of still processing and you know, COVID's certainly not gone, but it's in a different space. And so, yeah, so I was there in March for a couple of days with a couple of girlfriends and to see kind of all of the, the not tents, like the, the structures that took over a lot of the parking spaces so that restaurants could still stay open. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and, and to be in some places that I'd been in before and to see that like, a lot of tables had been removed to keep distancing and all of that. And uh, yeah, I remember getting on the train and just kind of being like, Okay, well, I guess we're doing this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'll never forget like going grocery shopping maybe in March, uh, right after everything got shut down in New York. And, you know, I was windexing my groceries. Right. That's how scary it was. And then mm. you're like thinking of morbid thoughts like, am I, am I going to live? I, oh, truly. But if I get this thing, you know, uh -huh. and I think, Again, you know, I just spoke about it earlier. So like African-American male in the Bronx, Bronx had crazy rates of COVID. Um, a tiny tangent. So uh, one of the things I talk about um, just with COVID in New York City was uh, how different communities were impacted by COVID. So like right. I was living in the Bronx and the only way you could get tested early on was you either had to... Um, be in close proximity of someone who was positive or recently traveled uh -huh. from a foreign country. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening was like Uber drivers, they were in close proximity of someone that was positive, but they didn't know. 
you know, so someone, someone's coming off the plane from Europe, from China, they're getting right. into a cab. Right. And they're, dro- they're dropping them off. That, that driver now has COVID. They don't find out for two days. They go back to their home in the Bronx in their, you know, um, inner city apartment building where they're touching elevator buttons and doors and they live in close proximity. Now the whole building has COVID because right. of that one driver. Right. And that building couldn't get a COVID test because when they showed up in March, they would say, have you traveled in the last seven days or in the last you know, 14 days? No, I haven't. Have you right. been around someone who was tested positive for COVID? No, I haven't. So they weren't getting tested. Right. It was absolutely insane. So I, I just remember being in the Bronx, knowing that the Bronx rate was like astronomical because mm. there wasn't, there's no, there's no way to social distance in Manhattan or in, no. in the city. And being black and they're telling you the stats, three times more likely to die. I was like, I'm not going outside. Like, right. <laughs> I was like, I'm, it was so scary. It was so oh, scary. I, I can't. So you're like, it's, I'm like, I'm, yeah, I'm Windexing, you know, Ritz, Ritz crackers box. Yes. Like, it was yes. just so crazy. It was truly, just, truly. And I have a girlfriend who was pregnant and um, she gave birth in May of 2020. And she had a friend who had to give birth alone because they weren't allowed any support people. Now, my girlfriend was lucky enough to have her husband there, but her friend had gone, I think, a month earlier. And in April in New York City, they were like, sorry about your bad luck. I genuinely cannot imagine. I can't. Yeah. Just, again, the traumas that everyone experienced in their own different ways and just so seriously in New York. Yeah. And you're so right again, like, a, an uber driver hits a button and you hit the same button and you didn't know there was anybody else in that elevator and then you're carrying around or you know windex and wipes and yeah that is that is very difficult absolutely I, i'm glad we're in a safer space now that the vaccine is available that they, you know the children are able to get vaccines now which is exciting um but yeah what a what a, i appreciate you sharing your story with me when you mentioned being on the subway i was like Tell me a little bit more about how it's for you. It's, it, it's, you know, it took me a while to get back on the subway. Uh, I was driving into the city to work early on. Um, yeah. And everything takes time. So yeah. I think after three months, I'm like, this is crazy. The gas price is nuts. Like, I'll take the subway. So I remember taking it for the first time. Yeah. Uh, but everything, is, you have to ease into it and you yes. get comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I will. We will come on to a happier subject and a more exciting <laughs> subject, and that is that you wrote a book. And if you don't mind, this is a little clunky, but I really I love the um, the the description of it. So I want to share that with everybody, and then I'd love for you to you to tell us about it as well. So, um, in the way up, climbing the corporate mountain as a professional of color, accomplished executive Dr. Errol here delivers a pragmatic and actionable guide to help underrepresented individuals from all ethnic backgrounds achieve their professional goals and elevate their careers in today's virtual workplace. The book takes a step-by-step approach to understanding the skills and strategies required to move from entry level and middle management roles to the executive ranks. So that was the, the quick blurb. Obviously you can do a better job of sharing it, but I just wanted to give everyone kind of the, the yeah. you know, tell me, I mean, obviously you've already kind of described what's, what your passion is, what your motivation is. So for you to be like, I'm gonna write the book on this. We know that, but like, just kind of tell me about the process. Tell me how you narrowed down what it is specifically that you wanted to talk about. I mean, I'm so, so, so excited to chat about this. Yeah. You know, so I always thought that I was going to have a book. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the title in my brain was like a cubicle to the corner office. It was always going to be something that was going to describe Mm-hmm. Um, what it takes uh, to try to go up the ranks in corporate America sure. only because sure. um, I do so much mentoring. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mentor um, high school kids. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I mentor at, at Fordham and even at NYU. I mentor college undergrads. And at link, on my LinkedIn page, um, people eat, message me all the time asking for like coffee chats, you know, five minutes. So they send me their resumes. But always, everyone's always asking for input and feedback. Like, how do I make it? How do I make it? How do I make it? Right. And I just found myself repeating similar stories over and over and over. Right. You know, it's like, I'm like a, a broken record. So I was like, I have to write this down. I just mm-hmm. have to write this down. And if anything, it'll be a resource for people moving forward. Mm-hmm. So that's really where the intent of the book came from. But because I was doing so many things, I was in school, 
I was working, you know, I was on boards and volunteering. I just never had time to like sit down and mm -hmm. write. And mm -hmm. so the silver lining of the pandemic was I was, you know, I, I lived by myself, not married, no kids. Mm -hmm. I had all the time in the world to write. So I think I remember my first weekend home after lockdown, like you're talking about 48 hours with nothing to do. Yes. Can't go out at night, can't go to a bar, can't go out to dinner. Like what do you can't, you know, what do you do? Even people in the park were wearing masks like early on in March and April. People like I remember going for a run and you know, people were like, you have to wear a mask. I was like, to run? Like it was kind oh. of crazy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, you know, I had so much time on my hands. So that's when I, I said, let me sit down and put these thoughts on paper. Um, I think it became even more of a sense of purpose after uh, George Floyd. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know, that, that was um, uh, Memorial Day weekend was George Floyd. I don't know if you remember the murder of George Floyd. I don't know if oh, you remember. Oh, yes. <laughs> on, the, on the same weekend was... There was a bird watcher in Central Park. He was African American, and a woman was like, didn't have her dog on a leash, and he was like, you need to leash your dog. And it was filmed. That happened the same weekend as as the murder of George Floyd, where you, have, you see like the death actually happened on camera. And then that's when this like, big, obviously, racial reckoning happened in the country of people just rethinking and re and you're allowed to actually say out loud. And right. talk about systemic bias and talk about racism um, because before I don't think you were allowed to do it in the workplace, and so that 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 totally like told me yeah this is it's the time, time. it's time um, so yeah so I had all the time in the world I was <laughs> doing my doctorate program at home and when I wasn't doing school I was writing the book and so that's that's essentially where it came from and uh, uh, luckily you know I had uh, good friends of mine that also wrote books. And so when I told them what I was doing, they, you know, they, they, they filled me up, you know, they're like, here's a book agent, call this person. You know, I had a very good friend of mine who I know, who I look up to a mentor, um, Keith Weish. He said, he wrote, he's now written three books. Oh, wow. Um, he's like, here's a book proposal. Like you have to write a book proposal. Here's the format. And so he <laughs> lent me um, his format so I could put it onto paper. Right. I, was, I had access to book agents I had friends putting me in a room the zoom room in a zoom room with different people who do books and I eventually met a gentleman named Dan Pearson who's like we're gonna make this story happen um right. and so that it has kind of happened it was like a coalition of the willing it was like a community effort people were just putting me in touch with different folks they believed in the project and you know you got an, I got enough no's to stumble upon a yes yeah <laughs> that's essentially what happened Oh, I love that. And that's so great. And that's wonderful to hear that, you know, you have this community of people who are like, you need to make this happen. You want, you say, I want to make this happen. How do we get together and make, and it's so great to, to feel kind of bolstered by that support of people and especially people who have gone before in it. Cause it's so important. I know in your book that you talk about um, imposter syndrome, I, I've done an episode on that. I feel that myself, again, we go back to talking about teaching, um, just anxiety, insecurities, taking care of yourself, the, the mental health component of, of all of it as well. Um, and it's just, it's so, it's such an important read for people, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So one of the reasons I felt the book was needed was I read a lot of leadership books. Like if you look behind me, there's probably a bunch that's on, on the shelf, a lot of leadership books. And many of the ones that I love, you know, good to great, um, true North, uh, authentic leadership, uh, they never really broached the subject on coming from an underrepresentation right. or being uh, a minority in the workplace, right. whether you're right. a woman, whether you're LGBTQ, whether you're uh, a racial minority, mm -hmm. uh, disabled, you know, all the different underrepresented groups in the workplace, mm -hmm. not really a place for those leadership books or those type of books. It's, it's really written from the stance of like the, the average person, right? right? That's kind of like upwardly mobile and they can get it done. And so I read a lot of those leadership books and never really felt that my story was there. So mm -hmm. I said, let me, let me try to 
um, put my story out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then two, absolutely, like I just learned from um, the past. And this, this, the book is definitely not like, do it like me, because I'm perfect. Like right. I actually try to be uh, vulnerable and say, I messed up on this and I didn't do this well. And I walk around confident, but <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing sometimes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Hey. You know, um, and it just spoke to like the importance of having your personal board of directors and you know any corporation they say they, they must have a board of directors because it's people who are, have no bias that sit and make sure that you're making the right decisions that's what a, the board of directors does for a company you know they're, right. they're a, a, a third party resource that's non-biased mm -hmm. that wants to see you successful and that asks you probing questions to make sure you're on the right track. And sure. they won't, they're, sure. not, they're, they're not a yes man. They're not gonna just like, you know, say, yeah, yeah, you're doing great. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. 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 And so it's like, you need that for yourself. So, you know, it's like, you're gonna have an executive coach, you're gonna have a mentor, you're gonna have a therapist, mm. you have to have a group of friends that are at or above your, the level you want to achieve. And if you're not intentional about who you, circle yourself around you like you know wake up five years later and say why am I in the same place right and, and that, that's what I really wanted to convey from the book and then also you know um this thought process of it's corp it's a corporate mountain versus a corporate ladder mm -hmm. and people enter the workplace thinking it's a ladder like right I'm on this rung yeah, and then I'm gonna go up, and it's like no, 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 no. This is like this is a mountain. You're gonna have uh, circular paths. You might have to go backwards to go forwards. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be rain. It's gonna be hard. You know, it, this is not easy. And don't right. go into it expecting it's easy. I think a lot of people assume like hard work, and I'll just get there. And I'm like, this. <laughs> it's definitely not the case. Definitely not. Right. The case. It's not so much just showing up at eight o'clock every morning and checking some boxes and you're magically going to have a C-suite behind your name in a, in a matter of time. It's figuring yeah. out all the things. And I like what you talked about, about the intentionality of, of your circle um, and how important that is. Not just like, oh, I happen to be friends with you. Here you are. But instead of saying just that, which friends are also wonderful, but then saying like, who are, who are the people who are going to help me get to where I want to be that I can rely on to ask those questions or to even smack me in the face with some hard truths sometimes. Absolutely. You need yeah. it. Absolutely. And I love, if I may, I'm obviously biased. You mentioned a therapist, which I think is wonderful. If you don't mind me walking down a little bit of a tangent. So, well, two things I wanted to talk about kind of the, the stigma of mental health generally, globally, your view of that working in the healthcare industry, your view of that from a perspective of communities of color, and then I also, sorry, this is kind of a little bit of a loose tangent, but it was just, it's just living in my brain right now. Your most recent Instagram post, which by the time this drops next week, will not be your most recent Instagram post, but about um, the implicit bias that people have, that providers have. Um, and you talked about how, was it, I apologize, was it Philly or Boston? Yeah, yeah hospital in uh, Philly, uh, I think it's University Hospital of Philadelphia. Philly, okay, I thought so about how 95% of providers, 99 and five, 95% of providers in a, in a study had implicit bias against patients of color. And we wonder why there is stigma <laughs> against getting treatment, not just mental health, against treatment in communities of color. Do we wonder? Do we? <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. Our, our system gets the exact results it's built for uh, I mean, yeah. literally that's what it is and we're trying to change that trajectory and you know now systemic racism is a buzzword i like to think about systemic uh, equity so i'm yes. like what yeah. policies procedures systems can we put in place that spit out equity yes as opposed to harping on this, the racism piece of like okay great understand there's issues of inequity how do we put in policies, procedures, changes, so that the outcome is equity, right? Yes. And yes. so I'd say for mental health, even for me, um, you know, I came, I grew up in a relatively religious household. My parents took me to, to church every Sunday. So the concept of like going to man 
for mm-hmm. your problems and not God was a big deal for my parents. Sure. So they're like, what do you mean you're going to therapy? Like, right. what, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, I can pray mm-hmm. and get health care. Like, it's not mutually <laughs> exclusive. <laughs> you know, it's not mutually exclusive. And it's interesting, too, because the church also sometimes does therapy for people, too. Like, mm-hmm. So I was like, I don't know why it's weird. Um, so there was a stigma just from growing up religious. And then also, I think, unfortunately, um, in communities of color, and I, I can speak to this uh, specifically, sometimes, even though you're living through stressful situations, mm-hmm. because everyone else around you is also living in it too, you, you, you sort of normalize it. Right. And so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm using air quotes. I'm not crazy. I don't need therapy. And uh-huh. for some strange reason, there's this educational gap between therapy equates to crazy right. and not the Therapy includes anxiety. Therapy includes stress. Mm -hmm. Therapy includes unpacking trauma. Therapy includes uh, wrapping your head around something that happened to you and thinking about your behaviors and the triggers of why you make the decisions you make. Mm. Uh, And I think people are still stuck on, oh, well, if I, you know, whatever this nebulous term of crazy is, if I'm not crazy, I don't need help. And so we have to dispel Mm -hmm. that, that rumor. And like, I'm like anyone who is, um, low income, like I'll just give you an example, uh, minimum wage in New York city is $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. So that's that's like $30,000 a year. If you live in Manhattan, Mm. $30,000 a year, you have stress, anxiety, and trauma. Yeah. Because it's so expensive that you're you're obviously going to be living check to check. Mm-hmm. You're going to be thinking about, do I pay this bill this week? Oh no, you know I can I cannot pay rent for thirty days, so I can forego that bill. But my phone gets cut off in a week, so I'm going to pay that bill. Right. My child care is coming up, so I have to do this. But then my my kid is hungry, so I, like you're living with this constant. Mm-hmm. trauma and stress on you that turns into diabetes turns into hypertension turns into obesity because you're eating to kind of process this weight mm-hmm. of the world that's on your shoulders and so I'm like you are the best candidate for therapy uh, and they're yeah. like no I'm, I'm good I'm strong I'm strong uh-huh. I got this I, you know don't worry about me I, I got this um and so it's also this like perception that it's a sign of weakness so yes uh so I just think, you know, we have to dispel those rumors and not like, I'm the first person to say I had to go to therapy. Mm-hmm. I still go. Mm-hmm. And I have first world problems. I'm very fortunate in where I am, but those problems are still problems for me. So I still have to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I would love to get to a point where therapy is um, destigmatized. Mm-hmm. And that they have access to it all if you have medicaid you have access to therapy it's part of the benefits right um but it's it's just unfortunate how many people don't utilize it because they're like i don't want to say i'm weak I, i'm fine right it, it is it's it's an ongoing conversation we have it so often about i you said i got this i'm strong and it's not that you're not strong i think it does take a courageous no i, I need to stop saying i think it takes a courageous person to be able to say, I would like to have somebody get in my business and muck around and maybe have some conversations that can help me to do that. You mentioned, so I have a binge eating disorder myself. That is how I like to, I mean, I have, I have adaptive coping skills too, but it's my favorite maladaptive coping skill is a bacon cheeseburger, right? So <laughs> how do I figure out how, you know, and, and it's figuring out those different things and finding out the access that you have. And you're right, even people with Medicaid, most people with insurance, again, it's a place of privilege to say like you could get a therapist, but there they are included in some of these programs. It's it's getting over that hurdle of I'm not crazy. It's that internal barrier that you've built for yourself of I don't need that for whatever many myriad of reasons it might be. And I'm so grateful when I hear people say like, oh yeah, I go to therapy. And just the same as, yeah, I go to the grocery store. Like it's just taking care of yourself. It's yeah. we were not meant to process this much information as we do every single day. We were not meant to isolate in some of the ways that we do. A lot of the stuff that we 
the careers that we have, the ways that we spend our time is not kind of what a humanity was supposed to look like. And, and so it's just still kind of figuring out that is, and I think therapy is a really great place to, to start (laughs) and figuring out, like you said, the thoughts that lead to the actions that lead to what goes next. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you an interesting story. So, and I, this therapy thing for me came about roughly in the last three to four years. So I'm still Mm -hmm. fairly new at it. It wasn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't believe all the time this, but um, it used to be if I went on a date with someone and they talked about therapy in the first couple of dates, it was honestly, it was a turnoff. I was like, Oh, problems. They got baggage. Yep. And then meanwhile, I was like, <laughs> I have unaddressed baggage. They have addressed baggage. And so That's now funny. I know. <laughs> so now I'm like, oh, you do go to therapy? Great. So do I. Like now yes. it's like <laughs> it's oh, something cool. I look for. <laughs> That's, but that, isn't that so interesting? And I'm pointing the finger at myself too, because I could probably have had this conversation myself of like, wait, who's the mentally healthy one here? <laughs> The person in therapy or the person judging the person for being in therapy who still has the baggage that has not been unpacked. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And totally, so that's totally we, yeah. And we just continue to try to, you know, voice this concern and decrease the stigma as much as we can and try to normalize feeling the things that we feel. It's not about necessarily changing our emotions. It's about changing our relationship to the emotions. And that is something that is very difficult to do. You know, I'm 37 years old. I've had 37 years of practice of doing whatever it is that I've been doing that got me to where I am. Really hard to undo that all by yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and the reason why I bring up therapy so much in the book is because um, if you are an underrepresented minority in yeah. um, corporate America, um, it's alone. It's it's uh, isolating. It's very yeah. alone. So um, at an early age in my career, um, because I was fortunate enough to like, uh, you know, rise up the ranks pretty quickly, I would look around the room, and there was nobody else that looked like me. Yeah. And so that's isolating in the room, and then you're like, um, what are people's perceptions of you? Yeah. How much of it are you doing to yourself versus is it being done to you? So you can get in your head, mm-hmm. and you know. It's, like you want to make sure you always make a good first impression there's other times where it can be intimidating so there's older people in the room and they're looking at you and you're like I don't want to look too smart because I don't want to be too intimidating so you're like dimming your light Uh to try to fit in your expectations so Mm -hmm. it's like don't be too smart but don't be dumb and if without without somebody helping me process that like you you're just in your head Mm -hmm. way too much Mm. And what happens is you're now spending an enormous amount of time just trying to survive, like be in this corporate space while your peers are not. Right. And so obviously it's going to impact how you perform. Mm-hmm. And so it, like, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy of like, well, right. you know, um, we never move up. And it's like, yeah, um, we, we, if we don't unpack these things and address these things, you're spending more resources on these things than your peers mm-hmm. that might not have it as bad. And that's, that's unfair that you're putting undue weight on yourself. So it's more so to be conscious about it. Yes. You know, like corporate America has to fix their things, but then there's things that we can think through differently as we navigate through it. Absolutely. And that's beautiful the way that you describe that. It's walking through it with intentionality of saying like, I'm going to recognize the things, the the maladaptive thinking patterns that I've taken on that might even have been something kind of a shield or like you talked about dimming your light so that you don't, you know, fulfill some sort of situation. And yeah, and it's, it's, it's difficult to do that when you're just kind of living in your own space, in your own brain. So being intentional about recognizing and, and changing those narratives is so important. Absolutely. All right. Well, I could sit here and talk to you for at least another hour. I hope that I can reserve the opportunity to bother you again in the future, but I do want to thank you so much. And I hope that you, I'd love for you to tell everybody and I'll put it in the show notes, of course, where they can find you. Yes. So Errol L. Pierre at Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. And the book is called The Way Up, uh, Climbing the Corporate Mountain as a Professional of Color. It's available on Barnes and Noble. It's available on Wiley.com and Amazon. And it comes out 
December 13th. So we have a couple more months before we actually fully launch, but you can yes. pre-order it. You can definitely- I was gonna say, but the pre-order is there, my friends. Hop to it, Absolutely. yes. Well, Dr. Pierre, once again, thank you so much for your time. What a beautiful hour we have spent together. I'm so excited for the, the, the listeners to get a chance to hear your stories. Um, and for the rest of everybody else, be curious, not judgmental, make it a good one.